Hi, everybody. My name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we do this show, you know, 25 times a year. We've done literally hundreds of them by now. And, and as I've said so many times, there, there's like from the very first show until this, this minute, there's been like one intention of the show, and that's to to put out a vibration of consciousness, of love, of oneness, just over and over and over again with all the different aspects of it, all the different pieces of it, all the different spokes in the wheel where the center is that hub of love. And, and you know, as I was uh, just sitting here waiting for the show to start, I, I, I was thinking like, for most of us in some way, either through religion or through you know, our normal processes in life. I mean, somewhere along the line, we ask ourselves, what is the purpose of this human life? What did we come into this world in this magnificence, this extraordinary planet Earth that's hurtling through the galaxies, that's, you know, a member of this solar system and that solar system? We sense a vastness. We sense an extraordinary motion of, of something, of consciousness, of love, of, of the infinite. Of, uh, in religions, we sometimes call it God. And, and we do ask that question, what are we doing here? What is the purpose of this human life? And somehow we know it's, it's vast and it's big and it's simple and it's for everyone. And that there's no exclusion, there's no separation from that experience. There's no right religion, a wrong religion, a wrong teacher. There's wrong country, wrong way of doing it. There's just that experience of who we really are. And so, again, tonight's show is dedicated to that oneness, is dedicated to that experience of sharing, of people sharing their love and their gifts to bring that experience of love out and that oneness out into, into a way that we can all experience it, into a way that those vibrations of it, those energetic patterns of it will spread through this camera, through all the cities the show goes to. And again, we're honored to be here with you and to allow us into your homes and for all the calls and the emails you send us encouraging us and, and inspiring us with your love. So tonight's guest is another person who's dedicated her life to that recognition, to that knowing, to sharing that knowing. She flew in from Oregon. We do the show in Santa Barbara, California, and she flew in from Oregon just literally for 24 hours to do the show. I mean, she has so much going on there, but she just wanted to come in and share her love with you. I mean, Almin is an extraordinary spiritual teacher and healer. Uh, she's one of the most remarkable mystics of our time. Uh, she's the author of a, a wonderful book, A Life of Miracles, Mystical Keys to Ascension. And really her message that really struck me when I first heard about her was that what she says, that it, that it is not my intent to tell you what I can do. My intent is to show you what you can become. My greatest wish is for you to stand on my shoulders and fly. So, and here's a person whose life is dedicated, who's had an experience of that infinite, of that love, of that oneness, and travels the world, again, to share that with anyone who's willing to listen. We'll make whatever effort it takes to share that. And then we also, as we normally do, have you know, some extraordinary videos, music videos, uh, from this uh, Crystal uh, Vista DVD from Yassos. Uh, he's very well known all over the world. And he sent us this beautiful music video, DVD, so we're going to show clips on that. So as we normally do at this time, please join me in a short meditation. Then we're going to start with the, one of the uh, Yasos uh, video pieces, and then Almin's going to be with us, and it's another opportunity for us all. So please join me in a short meditation. If you don't know how to do a meditation, just relax, settle in, take a deep breath, and allow this next hour to, to merge with you, and, and you merge with us. Bring your energy. We'll feel it. We know it. So thank you, and join me.
Thank you. So we're going to begin tonight's show with the Yasos music video. It's from his Crystal uh, Vista DVD, and he has m many amazing music CDs. But this is, I don't know how many um, uh, actual uh, music videos he has, but we have one with us, and we're going to share it with you. So. Beautiful. Well, we're on the set with Almin. Almin, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me, Alan. Yeah, it's great. So, your book is uh, called The Life and Miracles. Now, you know, I read, you know, good portions of it, and the beginning of your life was somewhat difficult. So, why don't you talk about that and how, you know, it, it became this blossoming miracle, even though it started out very difficult in some way? Well, um, 
really it's on our overcomings that we render the greatest service and you can have two lives parallel and one can become a sage and the other one can become an alcoholic and the difference might simply be how well they learned their lessons. And I know some sages who are alcoholics, so <laughs> you got the, they've, they've merged the two. So, uh, so why don't you talk about your specific experience, I mean how it, how it manifests. I mean you were a sickly kid and you were, you know, had near-death experiences like every couple of weeks or something? Well, a lot of very high dimensional beings that are coming in at birth um, really find it difficult to stay in mortality. I think back about how the wise men brought Christ, the frankincense, myrrh, and the gold. Those happen to be things that keep with their vibration high beings in the yeah, physicality. They ground you, right. so, it always so has no, there been. weren't three wise men when you were born. There were not. There were not. <laughs> but um, and you were br brought up in South Africa, and they yes, came to the United States. That's correct. And so it just was actually a desire to go back into the bliss and the oneness um, that makes a little child not very easily stay in body. And so that is some of what I had. So and and how did, was there a, like a time as a child that you had a realization that you were supposed to stay in the body? I and mean, was there a consciousness of that? Yes, there was. Um, I was about eight years old, and I had fallen into the river by the waterfall, and stood in the bottom of the river, and I felt an angelic presence next to me, and I stood in this bubble, perfectly able to breathe. And he said to me, "You've got to decide." Whether you want yeah, we to can't or keep or having you die at the we bottom cannot. of the river. This is not we happening. Cannot. Right. And so he said, decide. And I actually thought, you know, because I'd and had And this is at eight, eight at years age old. At eight, right. I thought of all the beautiful times I'd gone back and forth in that tunnel. But then I thought of how sad my mother would be, and I chose to live. Wow. And my health completely turned around at that point. Wow, that's amazing. That's a great story. Mm -hmm. So, and then you proceeded, and, and were you... Uh, a spiritual child after that, or a regular child, or did you just really seek to know that that information, that love, that connection? I've actually always sought the highest truth, even as a little girl, mm -hmm. and used to very much upset my parents. I used to hide world religions books um, under my mattress, and I started to read English at a very young age, and um, would study these books intently with the goal of gaining the highest wisdom from every path. And actually even uh, took a degree in world religions, always seeking the highest truth. Wow. And then in your life, so, so you were a seeker and, and, a, and a, from the time you were a little girl. And then in November of 2002, 2000 something happened that was a yes. shift for you. Why don't you talk about that? Well. Um, in November of 2000, I'd been a teacher and I was on the road. Um, many miracles had been become commonplace by then. Um, but something happened in an instant where I disconnected from ego identification and from identification of the body. I had no labels. I had no identity. It was all I could do to remain self-aware. And I saw the entire cosmos within my own being. And I realized that really we are the one expressing as the many, and there is no being outside of ourself. That's where the I am that I am comes from. And it was an instantaneous disconnection from ego and entry And into even though you've been spending your whole life before that, in, in essence, making yes. that attempt to do that and knowing that that somewhere along the line had to happen for you to really know that oneness, that truth. You had a disconnect. At I some cannot point. really say that I aimed for any particular goal, right. other than every moment to learn the highest lessons I could. Um, and even after that occurred, I realized that there is no point of arrival. There just always is the journey of exploring the mystery of being. It's something, isn't it? It is. It's exciting. Yeah, it really is exciting. So, what made you think that it would be? Of, of value and important for you to write this book and, and get that story out and get that information out? Um, we have had primarily left brain ascension techniques on our planet, Alan. And um, the history, you know, is a little long to explain to the viewers, but there, there has primarily been 
um, the type of mystery schools and the type of ascension teachings that would appeal to perception seekers. And those are the left brain oriented people. But this is actually a right brain planet. And so many of the mystery schools that dealt with the goddess traditions, with the praise, love, gratitude, until Christ brought it back 2,000 years ago, um, many of those mysteries had been lost, um, at least to the Western world. And so this is a path that the book maps out for both left and right brain seekers. And it maps out how we get to the place where we realize we are all things. We're a being as vast as the cosmos, having a human experience, and we're not these painful experiences. So, and, and your book goes through processes to learn that. I mean, to almost kind of like road balance map. the it's, hemisphere. It is. So, why don't you, you know, take people on that journey? Why don't you yes. start on the first um, couple of things? And well, in the initiate level, part of what we s seek to do is to cut the ties that bind. Um, social conditioning, for example, I is a major problem because we are taught to see the cosmos a certain way and it becomes what we see. So cutting the ties that bind means that we trace back those things that are pulling our strings um, so that we can hook up to God consciousness and have that pull our strings. So we overcome past expectations and our fears. And then in the adept level, we balance the sub-personalities within and the goal of that is to balance the emotional aspects. So many major teachers today are emotionally broken because they skipped that step. They gained the perception but didn't bother to create um, that inner family that puts them in the middle of their being. And the goal of that stage is to realize my being is my sustenance. Then we stop running around with our umbilical cord trying to plug it into relationship, into others to sustain us. And then the third level, which is mastery, is to master the minds. and to clear out the subconscious, to deal with the unresolved issues, to balance left and right brain, and then that access is God mind. And at that point we start to effortlessly know. We don't think so much anymore because thinking takes energy. And energy equates to consciousness actually. Because how much energy is available to us allows us to access more and more of what can be known by man. So you have like do you have techniques and tools that allow these processes to proceed yes absolutely and in the book we it's a road map and really the goal of the book is to transmute matter to light um, in the year 2013 perhaps the end of 2012 this planet has to make an enormous leap in consciousness many traditions point to that and um, it is essential that we become alchemists Okay, and El Kami is like Mikael, spelled backwards. Michael, the Archangel Michael, had the job of stepping light down to matter. El stands for matter, and Mi is consciousness, and Ka is energy. So Mikael stepped consciousness down into matter. We're the alchemists. El Kami has to take matter, and through conserving energy, um, step it up to light or consciousness again. And that's the task of humankind. How's it going for humankind? <laughs> how we do it as humans? How's that? Well, you know, I, I had often thought how wonderful it would be if we could accomplish an entire um, ascension of everybody on the planet. But it doesn't actually look as if that is going to happen. And again, there are no accidents. Um, such a thing allows for bodies to still remain in third dimensional reality so that another wave of beings can actually come into third dimensional earth where most of us will step up. And that's when that, that scripture will be fulfilled that says two will be plowing a field, one will be taken, one will remain, two will be sleeping in a bed, one will suddenly just not be there. Um, because some of the population will vibrate out of third dimension and literally become the alchemist that takes the matter to light. And will, will they maintain a physical body or n not necessarily? Um, it is physical. 
it is physical. Um, it's just depending where you're looking at it from. You know, um, if, if we're second dimensional creatures, to, to them we look not as dense as we do mm -hmm. to ourselves. So it depends where you're looking from, but certainly we will be able to relate as though we are physical. So if, if people are interested in knowing those techniques, can we offer them some you know, tonight some little tools or yes. beginning tools that would be valuable. Yes, valued. and um, the, the, the right brain technique is love, praise, and gratitude. It's devotion. The left brain technique is perception. And perception enhances devotion, and devotion enhances perception. So whichever route they take, um, if they find every day... Define perception. You've used okay. it a couple of times. Perception is to increase our awareness, to see behind the appearances, to see like the eagle that flies high and sees all things as equally unimportant or equally important. But there is no differentiation once you're up there and you've withdrawn your vision higher you're up. Higher at, you, the maze looks different it from does, a different yes. angle. right? And you start to also see symbolically you look behind the appearance and you realize that the entire universe is, is connected with you. So you can read every second what your next step is by observing things in your environment. Everything guides us. Every man is a guru if we, if we look. And so it's the looking part that I speak of when I'm saying perception. Okay, and, and to look clearly, you'd have to be fairly quiet inside. There couldn't be a lot of busyness or activity, would you say? You have to be very aware and you have to be still. And the stillness comes actually when we learn our lessons well. And if we track the knee-jerk reactions that we have in our day, if we make time each night to trace them back to where they began and see which lessons we left unlearned, and one day suddenly we find that we have stilled that internal dialogue. And in that stillness, all things are possible. So would you say stillness is what people have talked about in different spiritual paths? It's like meditations? Or, um, or is that the end result of, or that's what meditation is supposed to be? How would you describe it? I would describe living in meditation as living with attention to the moment. Living in the moment, living in the now. Um, it's the way we were when we were children. My mother used to set me out on the back lawn and I was so aware of every bird song, every fragrance, every little ant that crawled across my feet. And now we live in the next moment, which is um, a place where we leak power. If we, you know, the um, loop of time, the Maya called the Zavuya, and it's a flat figure eight. And where it crosses is the now. To the human body, it's right behind the belly button, and that is where our life force center is situated. So in other words, if we live in the now, we're living in our life force, and we cease to age, you know, and that is where power is. And power is necessary to make that leap to freedom. Um, there are many power seekers on our planet, but power is just a means to an end, and it is to transmute us from the human kingdom to um, a higher kingdom. But power, the, the, the people who are interested in power are interested in a different aspect of it in a way, seemingly. Well, um, you can say that I practice an ancient form of shamanism. It can be called many things. I mean, one could say that the miracles Christ did was shamanism. Shamanism simply is a technician of the hidden realms. But many of the shamanistic traditions, many of today, um, basically seek as its end power over the environment. Domination more than... Exactly, more than inter, interconnected inter, right. and, and interrelationship. And um, how does that get, how does that, you know, get like diverted? It, become a dead, it becomes a dead end. Yeah, right. How, what, what in a human being or what in a shaman, you know, takes it from the pure desire to like experience well, the there's, love of the one? Well, there's four different stages. And stage one is the initiate stage, and then stage two is where you balance the emotions like we spoke of, and then stage three is where the minds come into balance. At that point, you start to find suddenly that there's all this power available to you. And power is one of, the, well, it's the second largest temptation. 
And if you succumb to this temptation... the largest, just as long as we're <laughs> figuring out the temptation. <laughs> The, the largest is that when you go into God consciousness that you stay there. Because what you feel is such a bliss, it trickles through the cells. It's like morphine or cocaine or whatever people would use. Um, and there's no growth there. So you have to take that stage where you know that you're not this actor on the stage, but instead of walking off the stage, you stay in character, but remember that it's only a play. So you have to re-enter the human condition. That is the largest temptation. But if one were to succumb to the power, you they don't... They never get to that alone. You don't make that leap to freedom. And, and so, w is it uh, a flaw in a human being? Is it just... What makes somebody fall prey to the power or fall prey to the things that prevent the experience of the, of the freedom, of the love, of the connection fully? Often it is that they've skipped stage two, and stage two is the place where you realize my being is my sustenance, but also at that point if you fully live this, you become, a, you live what's called an unconditioned life. You are free from labels, you're spontaneous because you don't pen, depend on other people's opinion of you. You're unselfconscious like a child. Um, you guard your own borders, and you love yourself. When this is not in place, um, the technician of the hidden realms that has actually accessed power uses a brand new label instead of shunning the label, because labels trap awareness. And, but he uses, now he's got a brand new label, a, a label of being powerful. And so at that point what happens is that um, he succumbs to his inner child that is unloved by its own sub-personalities. You know, there's, there's inner child workshops springing up all over the country and wonderful, but they forget to connect the inner parent. And so the little child still might not have a very good parent. And it's never too late to have a good childhood, you know, the happy childhood. But it's Tom also Robbins. never never too late to have a good parent. That's the wonderful part of it. So when they neglect that, they, they fall prey um, to to needing outside approval. And um, those are the power seekers, and it's a vast different from somebody who seeks perception. Um, perception yields power, but it's not the end goal. And then you, you stay in humility. And perhaps, may I take a moment and just define what I mean by Absolutely. humility? Sure. You know, we throw that word around, um, but humility to most people simply means that they're worshiping another's arrogance. Humility means. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> delightful, please. <laughs> yes, worshiping someone else's arrogance seems like a, a real fun way to spend the afternoon. I'm less than, you know, which right. is still self conscious right, and course. still compares. Right. Um, However, humility is that you realize that our lives have been designed to reflect back to the infinite portions of its mystery of its own being that it has not yet accessed. And so in other words, we take light that has not yet been accessed and like that caterpillar that walks on the leaves and takes bites out of it, through our experience we're accessing unyielded light. And it becomes yielded, which leads to, you know, it yields to the infinite luminosity and power more and more and more. So literally, we are assisting the, the, the one through the lives of the many and vice versa. So, um, so what happens is that if we realize that it might be the serial killer reflecting to the infinite that which, which it's not, that could be contributing as much as the one who simply is embodying that which is already known, which is light. So the first part of humility is that all life has equal value. And I so liked what you said in your opening statements. All life has equal value. If we can realize that, we've got half of humility down. And then the second part Tell of Tell me so I can put the, at the ending, I could do the other you half. You do the you other know. half? <laughs> Hurry, fill me in here. <laughs> well, the other half is that... I don't want to be half humble. 
I'll be homo. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, the, the mind of man can only know the slightest sliver of existence. And the other half is that we acknowledge that we don't know. And if we do that, we are innocently experience life. And all masters live in this innocence because they don't think they know. That's the other part of humility. And so it requires humility to break free from that trap of power. Well, so I got something to close with tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know, and by God. It's <laughs> so, and, and yet the whole process, I mean, sometimes when we talk about this, it seems like heavy. You know, it seems like difficult. Yes. It seems like a grind, but actually it's blissful and the process of, of coming into that love and into that knowing is, is really what it's all about. I mean, really, it gives life that passion, that, that peaceful passion in a way. It's a path with heart. And, you know, my recommendation, I do a lot of counseling for people, my recommendation is that if you're not living a path with heart, I abandon it immediately. Yeah, it, can't, it can't lead you anywhere. Because it's your heart that tells you that you're at that cutting edge where light meets unyielded light where all power and luminosity lies. And you know, one thing, Alan, that might help our listeners if we could um, give them some pointers on how to take this unfamiliar information. And the three pitfalls that people usually um, have when they deal with unfamiliar information or the unknown. Let's, let's show the other Yasos video and we'll come back to that and okay, we'll do that whole thing. let's do yeah. that. Okay, so yeah, why don't we do that? We'll do the second Yasos video. I'm sure you'll love the first one. Then we'll come back and you know we'll go through all these processes with Almin, and I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. So the second video again is from the Crystal Vista, uh, Crystal Vista DVD. I'll say that fast ten times and see if I can get it out. Crystal Vista DVD, and it's you know it's magnificent. So it's another section of that. So Yasos uh, music video. Hi, we're back on the set. Yeah, I just actually wanted to say something because 
I was told by the crew that we're, you know, it's, it's going through funny colors, and I was talking to Almeet about it. And she was saying that, you know, sometimes the energy gets so strong that, you know, the technical equipment, obviously we're doing this at a, at a studio with cameras and equipment, that she was saying that she's experienced it before, that, you know, the equipment starts to go crazy. So whatever happens, just listen, settle in, whatever colors it is, whatever <laughs> lights are shining out all over the place. You know, that's what happens sometimes. So I just wanted to, to report that. Okay, so why don't you, you know, talk about the three, the three <laughs> kashas or whatever. It could be worse. <laughs> right, it could be worse. <laughs> could I be think worse. they're still seeing us <laughs> and hearing us. So. I, I, I did an angel um, um, video once, and it was professionally recorded, and the entire thing was just light and static. Wow. And I think we're doing better than that. We're, <laughs> oh, yeah. we're about two steps up from light and static. Light and so. static. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. What to do when, when you're confronted with the unknown, with unknown information? The three pitfalls that people usually fall into is, number one, that they think they know. Words are the unknown. And you have to feel them with your heart. You have to sound them out. Um, so, you know, just to think blatantly that you know because you understand English um, is a big pitfall. And we might not be able to explain vast cosmic principles just through the English language. In fact, the ancient languages were a lot better at that. Um, so the second thing is that people obsess about the questions. You know, should I believe this? Shouldn't I? Is it correct? Does it contradict? And obsession with questions, again, leaks energy. And then the non-cognitive ways of accessing it um, go down the drain. And then the third way is that people say they search for truth, but Alan, oftentimes what they're searching for is that which will reinforce their already held belief systems. And so the prison bars of their belief systems get thicker and thicker and thicker. Um, what I recommend that people do is that they, in fact, just tuck it away in the back of the mind and ask the universe to confirm or not. And sometimes information they receive today, years later, finally, aha, the other piece is there and it fits. So um, act as though you know to, pre to prevent that leakage of energy and wait for confirmation. And trust that if you ask a question to the universe, it will respond, it must. Would you say that, that at some point there's like a gauge or a, a, a almost like an organ in a human being that, that knows truth and when it comes in, it'll either vibrate in harmony of, or not vibrate in harmony or, or a, a knowing of that this is at least appropriate for me or not appropriate for me at that, this particular time? Um, the body truth that one feels, the non-cognitive way of accessing information um, is m multitudinous. There's many things that can occur. You know, some people have goosebumps on the back of their hand. Some people have sweat that's localized and it's less salty actually than normal sweat, but suddenly the sweat will just come out. Um, others have waves of vibration going through the body. Others will just feel their heart some sensation in the chest, but tears stream uncontrollably. And then others will just simply, you know, feel some pressure in here sometimes, and then they just see symbols, or they can even hear, or there's effortless knowing, or pictures form in the mind. Um, you know how, as children, when we were near someone that really didn't like children, but they faked it, we would have this tight knot in our stomach? That's a form of body truth. Mm -hmm. So there's many different ways that if we listen to our body that it would tell us that. And that, that would be f an accurate assessment of that situation. Yes, it would. If, if, if the body, in other words, if we knew the difference, the way our body felt in harmony and, and disharmony. Yes. I mean, a lot of times we don't know the difference, so it's just a big mishmash. But if we can have actually ascertained and leaned on that inner knowing and seen if it was accurate enough, then we can really trust that. If we slowed down just a little and live in the moment, we would feel it. It's just that we resist life so much. 
and thoughts. Why do you think that is? I mean, that's an interesting concept to resist mm -hmm. life, and and to do it is like a life's work to resist life. I mean, it's, it's an interesting way to proceed. We have entered this forgetfulness, you know, that we are one with the infinite, that it is impossible for something to happen to us, that we did not write into the script of our play. And because we think we are these lonely, isolated humans that are left to our own devices, um, we try so much to control the outcome of actions. Instead of just asking, what this moment is my next step, without any attachment to the outcome. That it's always the process, that you're not going anywhere, you're never going anywhere. That's such a big part of it, Alan. If we realize there's no point of arrival, it, it becomes pointless to try and control outcomes. So in other words, we can, if we, if we like erase our personal history, we're bringing the past towards the moment. And then if we're not going out to the goal, we're bringing the future towards the moment. If we can keep doing that and doing that and doing that and yes. doing that, somehow we'd arrive at being in the moment. That's correct. And, and getting rid of the social conditioning. Like even if somebody were to constantly ask, is, um, you know, why do I think fire is hot? Because my parents programmed me that way. I actually was on a show, and it was taped in Caesar's Palace with Sean David Morton, and he brought a, a torch out, and he was torching my arm up and down. He says, prove it. And he brought the torch out right on the radio show and, and started doing it. And no, it feels cool to me if I focus on its fourth dimensional quality. Fire in the fourth dimension is luminous. Third dimensionally, it's hot. But again, it's because our world view holds it there. So um, if we get rid of the world view, we, we get rid of a huge part of it because we stop trying to control, we stop trying to be a certain way, we just experience with attention to the moment, which is what you called meditation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always said that when you can experience that, you're like love in motion. And how would love and like motion that. be? In, you know, it's hard to say. Yes. You know, is it is it always calm? Is it always rainy? You know, I mean, we think it would be a certain way, and that's the concepts, and that's almost like the worldview of a spiritual person wouldn't wear black, would wear white, yes. and would have, you know. And I recommend that people live very passionately. You know, cry your tears. If you need to get your point across, and you've said it nicely several times, get bolder with it. Passionately express. Um, but underneath it all, be still and know that you are one with God. Um, the, the passion is imperative because it pushes density back. Have you ever seen a little baby in a restaurant? Yeah, I call it peaceful passion. And, yes. And it, uh, really, in, in the spiritual community, a lot of people, it's, that's it's, against they spiritualism. They Right. And so mm. it's like, yes, you know, hello, and my gruel bowl. And if you're not <laughs> doing that, you know, and you're wearing black and you're... Yes more boisterous even in a way. And then you can't be experiencing love. And it's so ludicrous to I me. watched this little baby in the restaurant. And um, you know, his mom carry, carried him in, hoping that he was gonna be a good boy. And he looked around and I could see that the density of everybody's emotions and anxiety was closing in on him. He threw a terrible fit. I mean, the four teeth were quivering, the face was red, just complete little ball of passion. And his mother didn't know what was going on, but I could see that then he went, ah, oh, that feels better. I pushed the density back with my passion. Right. And then he sat there chomping on his cracker. Uh -huh. yeah. So it's imperative that we live It's crushing. I mean, that density and that, those concepts are crushing on the human yes. childlikeness, the human spirit. Yes. And, you know, we start to take everything we do and everything about us and all our religions and our countries and the rights and wrongs so seriously that we wonder, why do I feel heavy? Why don't I feel enlightened, lighter, lighter, lighter? And then we, enlightenment becomes a heaviness. You know what I mean? So it just it kind of keeps adding to it. And we, why do I feel heavy? Well, I mean, you're carrying well, around in each moment so much. The more much sensitive you get, the more, the more painful these atrocities of man against man becomes. And so it's important, I think, that, that we learn how to process pain. And I recommend that we view ourselves as taking a shower in it and just allow it to pass through, allow it to pass through. Like let's say we've had a love breakup. Somebody's getting divorced, very painful. 
you just take an hour, you say I'm going to push it on the back burner, but an hour later you go in your office bathroom and you just cry and allow that pain to flow without obstructing it. Because what we resist, we strengthen. So if, if it flows through, we don't end up with scar tissue around our emotions, you know, and um, that's one reason. The other thing, of course, is we become more empathic. Empathic. Yes. And meaning? Meaning that you're feeling sad over something and I feel it as though it's my own pain. The more enlightened we become, the more our borders break down. And so it is important to know our own from others. In terms and how of do we feelings. learn that? When we get more sensitive and, and other people's pain affects us, how do we know? Or even the universe. I mean, you know, there's sometimes there are energies seem seemingly coming in from everywhere. How do we know when we stop and someone, you know, everything else begins? That is not an easy one. Well, we're getting to the end of the show. We're getting to the toughest <laughs> question. <laughs> and, and God knows if we're even still on the air the way things are going here, you know. So I guess we got to <laughs> might as well go for it in the last 15 minutes to see if we actually are on the air. When well, you see, the, the thing is that when you enter into God consciousness, literally you have blended with everybody's. And they're, they're for a long time until you re-enter back in the human condition, there's no difference. And so... Um, you have to re-enter back. You have to say, I claim this, I don't claim that. So, I mean, if, if you have that level of consciousness, you can almost set boundaries wherever you want. I mean, if you, you want to experience that person's pain, you can go in there exactly. and experience it, and if you don't, you pull back. And yes, exactly. Well, I hope that got on the air. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Are we just, Chris, what was it, light and, and crackling? Was that one your last show? White light and white static <laughs> the entire Do we have any more than white light cameras. and crackling in studio? And we have three cameras. Three cameras. That we got three cameras here. How many are working? That's the <laughs> question still. Well, I, I, I call ahead to make my bank transactions because I shut all their computers They're down. They're ATMs. You're the ATM wrecker. Yes. Here comes the ATM wrecker. <laughs> Just put the one system on in front where she's using it. <laughs> that, that probably broke the, the audio down, so we finished everything off. Uh, okay, so if you could give, like, I probably, we have like 15 minutes or so left. If you could, in this amount of time, give, like, hints for people. I mean, you've been doing the whole show, so it's like, let's start it again, you know, like the show. Uh, if you could give, after what you've said for the whole show, like, you know, three or four keys or cues or helps or, or, okay. or pitfalls to, to be careful of or, you know, uh, you, you talked about humility being one and I remember you talking about in the book uh, Power, you know, to come uh, to, to see yourself as God, the Father and I are one, the Goddess and I are one. Or, so, yeah, go ahead. I just, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just brainstorming with well, you one here. one good thing that we might want to tackle is, you know, the world seems to be going crazier and crazier and crazier. And in fact... You noticed. <laughs> I did. Very empathic. <laughs> well, the reason for that is that the light is increasing. It's doubling every year. And where change is resisted, it creates chaos. So those that are becoming light are becoming lighter and lighter. And those that are resisting it are becoming more chaotic. And so cohabitating with 12th graders and 1st graders in one classroom becomes very painful. And so as you say, For everyone. it becomes so heavy. Right. Yeah, and so perhaps we could take a look at a, a coping mechanism for that. Um, the for the 12th graders or the 1st graders? Well, for Every the 12th time. grader. Let's right. do the 12th right. graders because those the are the ones watching. Who will so actually be listening those are the ones to the listen. cackling and the lights. Right yes, there. they've hung in there with us. Okay, good. Um, when Peter got out of the boat to walk on the water, when Christ was walking on the water, there was a raging storm, but he didn't see the storm. He saw only his oneness with all things. His eyes were raised above the storm. Then Peter gets out of the boat and he wants to walk on the water too. And for a moment, he's looking at Christ and he forgets the storm, but then he sees the storm and the raging seas and he starts sinking. If we are in the storm, and we are, because we are in the closing end times of a third dimensional cycle before everything moves into a very much nicer world. And so all of the unresolved st stuff in the subconscious of this planet is being lived out right now. And so 
if we continue to keep our eyes above the storm. One way to do that is to find as many things each day to be grateful for, because another thing is gratitude increases. When you're grateful for the buck you have in your pocket, it increases 100-fold. Um, I see our finances going pretty much downhill for quite a while. So, you know, financially, we could look at the laws of abundance, and that might be helpful to people. And gratitude is one of the laws of abundance because it increases it 100-fold. Um, another thing is that you give so that you might get. If you live in poverty consciousness, and that doesn't mean spend money you don't have by using huge, uh, accumulating huge credit card debts, that's bondage, it's not freedom. But spend the buck you have gladly. And as you do that, you open the sluices and it has to continue to give. And generosity also opens sluices, because those are the sluices? believers. Sluices? Is that some uh, term? Like a sluice? No, a sluice in a, in a water um, channel, you know, where... I, I had not heard it before, but, you know, maybe you call all it? our audience had. I, is that like a... It's this little that gate a, that you open to let the supply of water through. Oh, really? Yeah, no, yeah. that's fine. Okay. So, so it opens the supply to be generous. Mm -hmm. um, another way to do it is to treat um, money like love. Let's say you're trying to get me to pay a lot more for something. That means you love yourself so little that you have to try and get every bit of love from me that you can. All I have to ask is, is this worth that much hugs and kisses to me? No, not worth quite that much. It doesn't matter if I overpay because nobody can take anything from someone else. The entire universe is a balance book. You know, I pay you 10 bucks too much, round about Rosh Hashanah, you know, there's a accounting being done, and I'm walking down the road and there's a $10 bill lying there. No problem, the universe has evened out the debt. If I pay you $10 too little, you can be sure I'm gonna have to pay it. Somewhere along the line, so you, Around you Yom give Kippur. it. Is that where? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't. I'm not that big. No, I don't know the holidays actually, as well. I have just <laughs> noticed that but around... But you seem to know Rosh Hashanah, so I was wondering if you do. I've noticed that around October... Uh -huh. That's your birthday. Well, that, that's when everything's got a... There's a reckoning. A, yeah, everybody's got it's a record birthday. around your birthday. I thought it was Rosh Hashanah. It's, it's, it's my mother's birthday and my parents' anniversary in October, I right see. around yours. You're the 25th, right? I am. It used and, to be and, spring and, where and I was and born. their anniversary and birthday is 21st and 24th, so... Ah, so there's a reckoning going on during those there days. <laughs> well, well, the only other thing that I can, can say is, you know, sowing and reaping is a law. And sometimes when we're in debt, we may have to take an extra job. And it doesn't mean that it's the job of choice, but if we do what's in front of us gloriously, we earn the right to move into something of higher value. Um, so even if we're stacking cans at Safeway, if we do it to the glory of God, and that praise, love, and gratitude goes into the food we're stacking, we're nevertheless doing light work. So, and I think what, you know, in some circles they call that like surrender or something of that nature, surrender into that moment. And, and what are the, the, the tools to help somebody do that? Who's working a job they don't really want to do, seemingly they don't like doing? Well, first of all, we've got to create a mold for spirit to fill. We've got to ask exactly for what we want. You know, these are the details. This is what I'd like. If I don't get it, no problem, just a preference. Because my being is my sustenance. I'm living in a state of, of contentment. However, um, having set the mold, now we focus on what is in front of us. Go back often and build your dream. Fan it with emotion because that's one way of calling forth answers to prayers, is emotion with intent. But nevertheless, in front of us, there is work to be done and do it to the glory of the infinite's love and light. Wow. To the glory of God. Well, that's fantastic. So, you know, we're coming to the end of the show. <laughs> uh, I think a lot was here for everybody. I mean, a lot of information, a lot of love, a lot of consciousness, a lot of energy. And whether the energy turned the, the color of the set or took the color out or, or made it black and white or didn't allow it to show sometimes, you could feel it, you know it, you know it was there. 
And so, you know, I, I mean, I want to thank Almin for coming. I want to thank Yasos for sending the videos. I want to thank you for watching the show. But ultimately, we're all in this together. We're all, we're all one, and we're all separate in that one. And that's the opportunity for us all. So good night. God bless you. Come again. Thank you very much. Good night.